Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Sunday Morning Forum at St. Luke's Episcopal Church. I'm Ed Bacon, the interim rector, and it gives me great delight, and I must say I'm honored to welcome back to the forum our friend and someone we really admire, Rafael Bostic, who is the president and CEO of the Atlanta uh, Fed, the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, which oversees a large geographic area in the Southeast, and we'll get into that. Um, Rafael has come to Atlanta after uh, an esteemed a career in academic economics, and now he is a leading practical economist doing something about life and changing it for the better. So with that small and superficial introduction, Raphael, welcome. Thank you, Pastor Bacon. It's really good to be back with you. Thank you. It's great to see you. It really is. Uh, Raphael is uh, alluding to the fact that he was with us when we were able to gather at St. Luke's, he was a forum guest then, and really brought in a lot of people and made a great, was a great hit. And at that point, we were talking still about economics, yes, and still about people who are hurting, yes. Um, but we were kind of comparing Atlanta to other cities at that point in terms of economic mobility. Today, we're gonna focus on something that's still related but really is a result of a, a fiery, mm -hmm. wonderful essay that Raphael wrote this summer that I think changed the conversation in America about economics. And what he did was after those horrible murders uh, that we experienced in February, March, April, and early May, he wrote an article about racism and American economics. So that's what we want to talk about. Raphael, I'm really grateful again for that essay. The link is up on the website right now for everybody to read. Uh, thank you for that. Well, thank you. Uh, well, you know, it was something that uh, me and my team really just felt like needed to happen. It was, as you, as you all know, it was a very turbulent time people were um, were pretty upset and it had the, the potential to really uh, wrench us even further apart than we were before. And for me, I just felt that um, in my role, I was gonna get asked about this all the time anyway. So rather than do it piecemeal, just let's put something together uh, and really lay out sort of how I think about it and, you know, and what I think we need to do about it. And for me, I, I think there were a couple of things that really I thought needed to be laid out. The first was that um, the events in the last, at that point, it was the last six months that had gotten so much attention. That wasn't the beginning of this. That was, that, that was just symptomatic of things that have been going on in the US for, for centuries, actually, in terms of institutions being tilted against African-Americans um, and I think it would, for me, it was important to place it in that context, that this was, this was just another thing on the pile as opposed to uh, some new thing that we we're just discovering. Um, the second thing that really was in my head was, um, you know, you hear a lot of talk about racism as something that's not moral, um, but it actually, it runs deeper than that. And it has real uh, economic implications that touch all of us you know, one, one thing that I've learned in my many years on this planet now is that uh, to get people to do things, you really have to make a case that it's in their interest, uh, that, you know, morality is only going to take you so, so far. And ultimately, if you want to see real investment, people have to think they're going to get something from it. They're going to benefit by it. Uh, many, for many people, morality is enough. That moral dimension is enough. But for far more, the economics, the pocketbook just sort of potential and security is, is a lot more compelling. And so I wanted to really make the case that, that racism and structural racism actually makes our economy smaller than it is, which means that it makes us less well off collectively than we could be otherwise. Uh, and that wasn't good. And it's particularly not good in a world that's becoming more and more 
uh, competitive. We're, the global competition is greater than it ever was. So we can't afford to be leaving people on the side. Uh, we really need to make sure that, um, that everyone is engaged. Uh, and then the third part is um, really about, this is something, we actually can do things about this. And I wanted to, to make, the, make a point that, you know, we at the Fed can do things about it. We had to do it at the macro level and at the micro level. But I, I hope that people would see that, that that's true for everybody. But everybody can get up and do some things to try to make progress on this. Um, and you know, I, I'm really gratified by the response to this. People have really taken it and it's caused them to really think about well, what does this mean for me and, and my community and the people who I engage with? And can, can we use this to make progress and move forward? Um, and, and just to, to, to tie the arc with sort of where we started last, last uh, I guess a little more than a year ago in, in 2019, um, all of this is about inclusion. And all of it is about, you know, what can we do to make sure that every American can be truly in, enjoying the fruits of our, our wonderful society? And if we don't do that, then we are collectively less than. And so uh, there's, we all have an interest to, to try to make that happen and, and make, make a positive change. Uh, so, so I think you know, it, a lot has happened since I saw you guys last, uh, but almost all of it is along the same dimensions as where we were before. Uh, and so this is, uh, it's gotta keep going. Indeed, I, I do feel a continuity between where we are now and, and when we had that wonderful conversation before. And also, we're, it seems to me that we are in a different chapter in American history uh, because of the horrors of February, March, April, uh, and May. And um, I, I, for, I, as I was tracking what you just now said, um, there were more than three points you were making. And I do want to just highlight um, one of the, the first ones. In your essay, you make sure that we are getting the story straight. Uh, to get the story of America right, when it comes to racial inequity and oppression, is, I think, the project for all of us citizens of America. And I want to commend to our viewership, again, how you, in one paragraph, just lay out the history of race in America and the institutions that have been built on racial inequity and oppression. And that's very, very important for us to revisit. Every, every national leader with whom I'm talking since May are making sure, we are all making sure that we are all re-examining our history. So people can reread that. I wanna go on then to the point that um, I think we still need more converts about in America. And that is the reality of institutionalized, institutionalized racism or systemic racism. And you make a very important point about that. And we don't have to take up an awful lot of time, um, but I just wanna know if before we get to the role of the Fed, practical um, things that we're going to do, and and that you're helping lead us, and also a kind of a new world that you're painting for us, which is really quite inspiring. Let's just go back to the issue of systemic racism. Do you want to say anything else about the systemic nature of racism? Well, you know, um, Pastor Baker, listening to you sort of triggered some other things. So I feel like in the last four months or so, I have actually become a historian that the history of so many of our institutions is not well known or understood by anybody. So we just did a conference with a joint conference with Princeton University, I uh, talk about race and finance. And I had a historian speak about how there has been racial bias in municipal bond markets, which has affected how expensive it is for communities to raise funds to invest in parks and those sorts of things. And there were conventional wisdoms that neighborhoods that had a lot of African-Americans in it were just riskier. So they had to pay more. So to just build a school was more costly in those communities. So sometimes it didn't happen. 
or sometimes they had to cut corners. You had a smaller scale and you couldn't invest in computers or whatever it is. Um, that's institutionalized bias, right? That has real impacts on the ground. Another one I talk about, which I didn't include in the essay, but I've since like come to appreciate social security in the 1930s, you know, they made an uh, FDR and uh, the congressional representatives made a, a compromise where they said, if you worked in certain professions, you were not eligible for social security. Well, guess what? In the South, 80% of African-Americans worked in those professions. So they locked everyone out of social security, which meant that there was no safety net. There was no ability to preserve any savings that you had when you were in your, your older years because you had to spend them. Um, and that, and then, then the other part of systemic racism is that it then feeds through to everything else. So now that you don't have an ability to save money, um, you have nothing to pass on to your, your, uh, the new generations. And so they don't have that inheritance that they can use to uh, buy a house, put down payment for a house, or maybe start a business, and you just get stuck in a rut. And you're, it's very difficult to get out of that cycle. So the effects of those institutional decisions early on, they ripple through for generations in very significant ways. And that's part of the discussion today that doesn't happen a lot. And, and um, that where there's not a lot of focus on the fact that you know we are still a byproduct of those early decisions, uh, which have really locked in different trajectories. Uh, and if we're going to really start to see change in, in a more equitable economy, um, we're going to have to face that somehow. And that's a that's a hard conversation. But but I think most people don't even recognize that that's where we are. And so. Um, so that's part of the kind of the discussion we've got to have. It's almost as if that is the golden thread that's tying all of the varied speakers I'm having in these forums, that to some degree or another, all of us are retelling the story. Um, I have a dear friend here at St. Luke's who expressed her anger at having to unlearn so much that she was taught about America and everything from the 1619 Project all the way through uh, Brian Stevenson saying, uh, the South lost the war, but it won the narrative in terms of the lost cause and perpetuating this whole notion of which James Baldwin called the lie of there being an actual variance and hierarchy of human worth in God's creation, as opposed to inclusion and equity. So I'm preaching re-narration all the time and re-narration in terms of slaveholder Christianity all the way to now to economics, which we are going to get to in a few minutes. But that's a rich thing to say right now. Go ahead. Yeah, so if I just jump in here, Please. I think this point is another part of the conversation, which is that this isn't actually about any of us who are alive today. Right? You don't actually have to be racist to be part of a system that is perpetuating racist decisions, right? It, we, because that stuff happened before us and has locked in people, um, we are in that system regardless of whether we want to or not. We have all of the biases. I tell people all the time, I grew up in the same, in the same system. So I, I have biases just like everybody else. I get nervous when I see young African-Americans um, that I don't know that in a place where I'm not expecting them to be. That's a bias, that's irrational. Um, and so we just have to acknowledge them, notice them, and then work to fight against them. Because as long as they remain unspoken, um, then there's no way you can actually have dialogue on it. Uh, you, you have to call it out and name it. And then from that, then you can start to make progress. Um, and, and the last thing I'll say on this, because I know we're gonna talk econ is, um, uh, one of the things I've tried really hard to do in these conversations is not talk about blame. Like this is nobody's fault today. It is just where we are. And, um, and so I feel like a lot of the defensiveness is because people hear you're a bad person and there's no intention on that. I mean, there may be some bad people out there, but most people are not that, that I've, that I've encountered. 
Uh, but we have just been born into a system which has not been fair for people for a long time, and that makes it hard. Agreed, agreed. And we have no chance of changing that system unless we look beyond, I mean, much is at stake in the presidential election. And we must look beyond that because that's where the deep hard work is going to be. And in order for us to have a United States of America instead of a divided States of America, be it in terms of uh, economics or whatever, um, we are going to have to make America an, an attack free zone and stop this personal divisive polarizing uh, attack all the time. Uh, Rabbi Heschel said, you know, in, a, in the modern society, uh, very few people are guilty, but all are responsible. And I think you're calling us to a responsibility about economics and race. So let's talk about economics, if we can. Um, oh, before we do, as a, as a way of going there, let me segue there by, by telling you this story. So I saw this New Yorker interview with Brian Stevenson, who said, mm -hmm. and this was right after George Floyd was killed, uh, was murdered. Uh, he said, the protests are very, very important. I don't want to belittle them. And I want to say that the hard work is deeper than the protests. Well, soon after that article, I uh, hosted Beverly Tatum, uh, the Spelman College um, President Emerita. And I said, and, and it was the second time for her as well at, at St. Luke since I've been there. And I said, okay, tell me what would be the signs of going deep, deeper than the protests. She said, are you, you serious? I said, yes. Yeah. She says, it's all economics. She says, you start with the living wage. And then she clicked off five agenda items that were stunning. And so that's my way of coming to you, Raphael. And please, I want you to call me Ed, if I can call you Raphael. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. I can do that. Or I'll go back to talking about Professor Bostic or something like that. So um, <laughs> unpack. What well, Number one, your thesis is our economy is weaker because of the existence of systemic racism than it otherwise would be. And anything you want to say about that thesis, and then kind of unpack the different aspects of American economy. Well, what I would say to start is that underlying this thesis is that um, there's a fundamental humanity to everyone. And if everyone is truly human, then everyone has the human potential. And the boundaries on that are not different across people of different backgrounds, whether it be race or gender, sexual orientation, whatever you want it to be, being left-handed, right? The, the, the range of talents and the ranges of ingenuity and intelligence are the same across all of these. So uh, that's the underlying thesis of all of this. It sort of, it runs counter to some of the, the supremacist viewpoint, which is that the, the ceiling on people vary depending on what you look like or where you came from. I actually think that's just wrong. Uh, I think there's a lot of evidence that suggests that that's wrong. Um, if that's the case then, then it's just as likely that the next great innovation is gonna come from um, a poor African-American woman than it is from Bill Gates's child. Um, and by not giving that African-American woman a chance to innovate, by not giving her uh, a, a wraparound set of supports so that she can get skills and learn and do all those things, um, you are basically saying, we're not gonna get that innovation. And we may miss out on the next great, the next great idea. Uh, and, and that will be worse for all of us. Like how many of us have an iPhone or are benefiting by those things? These ideas reach into our society and become essential to it. We won't get on any of that. So, if you think about what we need, on one level, we need to make sure that every child, when they are born, uh, and as they uh, grow up, grow up in an environment where we get them the essential skills and that essential confidence and the talents and mentors and networks so that they can have those ideas become real. 
right? And, and so there's a whole set of investments in that, in schooling, in uh, mentorship, in, um, in, in networks, in safe streets, because in, in stable housing, like all these things we know have important implications for what kids are going to do, like how they're going to live and what they're going to focus on. And that's super critical. So, so, so to me, changing the, um, the child experience in America uh, writ large to make sure that um, where you live doesn't uh, consign you to a, a qualitatively worse experience, um, that's, that's job one. Then the second piece, and, and you know, one, one of the challenges here is that you know, we've got we to gotta sort of build the ship uh, so that people, the next people coming can just get on the ship and go. But we also have a bunch of people who are already in the ship space uh, and we got to think about them as well. So when you think about Dr. Tatum's living wage, that's for people today, right? That's for people who have, who have gone through their, their schooling. Uh, and, you know, for many of them, it, it didn't give them the step up and the potential. So we can't just forget about them. We actually have to think about what that looks like. And so, um, so living wage is one thing. One area where, where our bank is focusing a lot on is the workforce development infrastructure so that as people um, uh, either get disrupted out because of technology or through a COVID environment, uh, lose their job because they're in a service industry, um, we need an, an infrastructure that allows them to reskill, to get trained into the, the jobs of tomorrow so they can be competitive and they're not left behind. And so we just uh, established a new, uh, a new uh, partnership with the Marco Foundation called the Rework America Alliance, where we're gonna go to local governments and, and local community colleges and local businesses and try to work with them to redo um, and reimagine what a workforce training and workforce development infrastructure looks like to make that relevant. So, so it's those sorts of things that you have to do in today's world to, um, to make sure that, that, uh, that we include everyone. The other thing I think is important is um, for each of us to think about and really think critically at what are our networks? Like who do we talk to and who don't we talk to? You know, one of the most amazing things that I had the, I've had the pleasure of listening to, and I just listened, was uh, the Chamber of Commerce um, meeting, Metro Atlanta Chamber meeting. Uh, one of the longtime Atlantans uh, basically yelled at the, the audience, all of us, basically saying, you know, we've all said the right things, but we're not doing the right things. And he asked, how many of you have invited someone uh, of a different racial background to play golf? How many of you have actually been in the living room of an African-American? Not just been in the living room, not, and that's not saying you had to do anything. And if, if you don't have networks that reflect that diversity, then it's hard to really appreciate how you bring that diversity into a broader context. And so I think we all need to, to look at our networks and look at who we talk to, how we talk to people, um, and who we're informed by uh, to make sure that it is inclusive uh, because then we actually become we. Um, uh, you know, uh, Ed, you were talking about, you know, big love and you said, love your enemies. That's, that's changing the network. That's changing the set of people who you're informed by. Uh, and it's, it's very, this is very consistent with that uh, as an action item. And it's something that we actually, I think can make a difference in uh, individually, like this is this is one of those micro things that we can uh, we can try to control. Let's stay with your list of action um, items because you in your in your essay you talked about education, you talked about training, you just added to the list networks, which I think is awfully important. Um, another word, for, again borrowing from Brian Stevenson, is proximity. With whom are you in proximity? Um, and and that's across a lot of different cultural identities, um, as you mentioned, race, sexual orientation, et cetera, and also class. 
and also people who are in trouble. Um, and he was talking about how his life has been transformed um, by working with people who are in prison. So um, education, training, network. You also mentioned access to capital. So can you address that issue as an action item also? Sure, so but before I do that, yeah. I wanna go back to on this class issue because I actually think it's very important. And it points to another project that we're working on, which we call advancing careers, but which I usually describe it in terms of benefits clips. And it's the idea that if you are on public assistance, if you get support like food stamps or, or housing supports or the like, um, usually it's when you get, if you earn one extra dollar, you lose a dollar of support. But if you're on three or four different types of support, when you earn one extra dollar, you lose $4 of support, right? So you actually are worse off by trying to better yourself. And that's, our, that's the incentive that we have set up and how we, we set up these systems. Um, and so when, when you think about poorer people or people on supports and they're not actually going to get job training, uh, there's a reason. It's not because they're lazy or they're dumb. It's because our incentives have made it so onerous for them uh, we, we've done some calculations and in some careers, you know, it can take 14 or 15 years before you break even. Think about that. So, so if, and you, if you have children or if you have uh, others that you have to care about, are you gonna put yourself in the hole by 14 years? You're not gonna do that. That's, that's the dumb thing. That's the irrational thing to do. Uh, and so, um, so this, this idea of understanding people and their thought presses by class as well is really an important one, as you talked about. Now, in terms of capital, oh, go ahead. You you want to yeah. jump in there? So you're you're referring right now to the wealth gap, right? And how how we have it structured for the wealth gap so, to be there. So I so uh, in part, sort of indirectly, I I think um, you know we always one of the things that economists say is that. Um, people should invest in human capital because it gives them skills to, to make them marketable for higher paying jobs. And uh, if you get those higher paying jobs, now you're no longer living pay paycheck to paycheck. And now you can start to build up savings, which then can translate into wealth. Right. And what I'm saying is that in many instances, if you're getting any kind of support, that narrative does not work for you because by, by getting human capital, you're actually making yourself worse off for 14 or 15 years. Got it. Right. So you shouldn't. Even, so you're not going to do that. So, so the, the, our usual story about how you make it advance just doesn't work once you get into certain circumstances. And it's because of how we've set up the problem. It's not about them. It's about us. And that's. A, I think that's an important message. So we're going and working with uh, policymakers a, a, across the country now, um, trying to get new configurations of incentives to make it easier for people to do this and um, to make it more sensible for people to invest in themselves because right now is not is not that and so so that's really how i how i think about it um, then in terms of capital so capital is a really important aspect here um, uh, for a number of reasons one it's always important right so if you're going to invest in things it's rarely the case that investors have just a lump sum, a pile of cash that's around that they can just pay for everything on their own. They usually need funds from others and, and you know, we call that collectively capital. And you can get that by equity investors who like give you money and they become part owners, or you can get it through debt by taking loans and, and the like. Uh, capital, access to capital just as a general proposition um, is not, equal and even across the country. And we've known that for a long time. Uh, there are minority communities, lower income communities, um, people of color in general often have a much harder time getting capital and that's independent of their education. So I can tell you stories when I was a professor of trying to, I wanted to do some research. I went to foundations and they gave me a super hard time to get fun, funding. And um, then, then I, looked at what was required for some of the organizations that I was researching on. And it seemed like they had a much more straightforward approach. And it's sort of, you got to think about that. Like what, what's underlying that and why does that happen? 
So, so this capital issue is super important and we need to, and we're engaging a lot with philanthropy in general to sort of lift this up and say, look, um, and actually by race is true, but also by region. So the South more broadly is, gets far fewer philanthropic dollars from national funders than any other part of the country. Far, I mean, it's, it's just off the charts. We did a report on this about four or five years ago. Um, so, so the unevenness of flow means that the, there is an unevenness of potential and there's an unevenness of ability to, to really take an idea or uh, uh, a hope or a goal and, and bring that to life. And so, um, so we think about that. Then you talked about wealth ed and here is the other piece to this, which is that um, we also know that African-Americans on average have one-tenth the wealth of uh, uh, white Americans. And so the, 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 the stylized fact is on down payments. Uh, when you buy your first house, usually you've gotten some help from a relative with the down payment, right? Well, in African-American communities, there aren't a lot of relatives that have anything to help you with, right? And so then capital becomes so much more important. Another stylized fact, so you, when you start your first small business, um, they call the funding usually comes from what they call uh, fam friends and family, right? You is who you know is the networks that you know that that are willing to take a a, a, stat, a chance on you. Um, again, in these situations, if if your network is only African Americans, the likelihood that you're going to be able to cobble together enough money to really run that business is is low, and, or your ability to take an existing business and take it to scale is low. And so the, the absence of, of wealth uh, means that for many, their networks can't produce enough capital for them to get to scale and be much more self-sufficient, which then means that the external sources of capital become more important and more significant, but they're often not as easy to access. And so it's, it's, a, it's a real conundrum. And you know, I, I came out of that Princeton conference that I talked about really thinking hard about this, like how do we um, prevent people who live today from being penalized by the inability of their forefathers to generate wealth? And that, that is a, that's actually a deep question. It's not, it's not an easy, there's not an easy answer to this, I don't think, but it's one that I think um, I know has been bouncing around in my head and, um, that's another, another knot in this racial equity, or another, another. I'm going to, I'm messing up illusions, but uh, it's another part of the the, the racial equity puzzle, uh, because you can't just, you can't just assume that if we put someone here, they can just run, because they're they're already so far behind from a generational perspective. I so appreciate your analysis and. Uh, it's it's complicated and it's historic and it gets to the story and when we whatever story we tell we develop policies to match that story so i'm really really grateful for all of that and it's time in our conversation to get to the action steps and understanding uh, the caveat that you just gave us that not all of these things can be turned around real quickly with action steps because there's some deep stuff going on as you became aware of in, in your reflections on the uh, Pr Princeton gathering. However, I do know you and know a little bit about what's going on as a result of participating in a webinar that you and your counterpart in Boston and Minneapolis um, hosted. And I think you have more planned for that. Nevertheless, what, how are you organizing the Atlanta Fed and your staff uh, in terms of your action steps? Well, we're doing um, like a series of things. It's, it's actually, I was actually thinking about this a couple of days ago, like the many dimensions that we're trying to weigh in here. And I was a, a little taken aback. We're, 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 we're pretty out there on this. So at, at a very basic level, the, one of the first things we've started doing is just looking at our own internal policies. Like what things are we doing internally that might be um, making things more difficult for um, for our uh, lower income employees, but also for African-Americans and people of diverse backgrounds. And we're really having different kind of conversations about this in ways that I think are, 
been quite quite useful. I talked about uh, the Benefits Cliff Project. I've talked about Rework America Alliance. We're doing a lot of partnerships to try to get our knowledge and our analytical firepower deployed in ways that can and result in actionable solutions. And one of the things that um, I was, I've long been frustrated with with the Fed, I started at the Fed and we did these things, is that we would have these great conferences, really smart people, some good proposals, uh, and then we would write it up in a volume and put it on a bookshelf and hope that a policymaker would at some point stumble upon it and then figure, oh, I can do this. Uh, and so we're, one of the things I really appreciate now is we are not, that's not what we're doing. Like we, we are, we're actually not producing a lot of volumes to be put on bookshelves. We're taking our stuff, we're trying to create tools that are pu public facing and we're trying to engage with decision makers so that they can uh, make decisions. They can actually make, make uh, progress that can change. Um, we're also developing a lot of, a lot of tools for people. Um, I, I actually think that uh, one of the most important things uh, for us is to let people know all the things that we have. So we have a whole suite of things on financial literacy and, and um, uh, economic resilience that um, I think a lot of people don't know we, we have. Uh, and they're really aimed and targeted at regular people so that they can get uh, an understanding of, of how the world works. Uh, we are using uh, our relationships with banking institutions actually to, to try to get them to rethink um, ways that they might engage with their communities uh, because I think that's an important thing as well. Another thing that we've just done is adopted a school. Um, in, in, and this is a short run thing, I'm just gonna say that. In, in the current environment, because of um, the COVID situation, you know, where the schooling is necessarily happening uh, from a remote posture. And a lot of kids from some neighborhoods uh, don't have access to uh, broadband or may not have a laptop to really be able to do their training uh, or their schooling. And so the adoption is really we're going to provide some some training. We're going to provide some some equipment that really allows for uh, some real change uh, and allows the kids not to fall behind because this is a potentially an at risk situation for them. Um, we're actually we actually a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month and a half ago now in September, released a white paper about how do you think about um, the the introduction of uh, innovations in uh, financial in the finance space, all these apps to do banking and the, the PayPal's and all that kind of stuff to ask, you know, are you guys thinking about what this means for financial inclusion? Uh, in, the, in the case there, we said, okay, what happens if you're from a community that mainly does things in cash, like a lot of Latino communities do, right? You're locked out of all these things, right? And are we okay with that? And, and or should we be okay with that moving forward to try to raise questions and to create new kinds of conversations? And then you talked about the racism and the economy series. Um, that's another one where um, I'm kind of surprised that we, we they, they, that we got this off the ground because it's truly non-fed. And uh, you know, we did our first our first program uh, in early October, and uh, the conversations were conversations that no one thought you would ever hear at, at an event that had a Fed banner on it at all. Uh, and it was remarkable. It was truly remarkable, but it was uh, it was not angry in the way that it wasn't just yelling. It no. was substantive. People had real ideas, uh, real proposals, and they wanted uh, a real engagement, which is what we wanted. We want we want these ideas to really get a, a, a broader airing so that we all can collectively think about it and and hopefully get to solutions. And the last thing I'd say on that part is that. Oh, one of the things I'm really pleased about is that we are not limiting discussions to things that all, that the Fed has tools necessarily to solve. Right? Our goal is for the broader economy, the whole economy. Uh, and that involves a lot of things that we don't have direct policy levers to affect. Uh, but if those things are not affected, then, our, then back to where we started, our economy is gonna be smaller than it was before. Uh, and we will be less resilient than we could be otherwise. And we'll be less innovative. And then that has adverse implications to Federal Reserve mandates. So I think it's really important that we're in there. 
Um, I think it's actually significant that it's a, it's a partnership between multiple reserve banks because it really is sending a message that this is more than just one personality trying to drive things. This is uh, a, a, a coalition of people who really want to make, make a positive change. I was going to ask you if you feel like you're out there by yourself. And part of my answer is as a participant in that webinar, that it, you had your counterparts from Minneapolis and Boston there. So I'm assuming you're not out there by yourself. My hunch is that you're leading or inspiring the way, but thank God other people are joining hands with you, right? Yeah, I'm definitely not out there by myself. And I, I would just say, um, you know, in this one, no one went kicking and screaming to, to do that series, yeah. right? No, uh, Neil in Minneapolis, uh, started feeling, you know, because Minneapolis was, was a, a focal point for so much. Uh, and he really felt strongly that we can't just sit by and do nothing. This is something we have to get out in front of. And I was like, sounds good to me. So let's, let's do it. Uh, but, but I will say, you know, Mary Daly in San Francisco, Esther George in Kansas City, who has for more than a decade, I think, run a conference on minorities and banking to try to think about diversity in the field. Um, Eric, uh, Pat Hark, and Phil, uh, it's across the board. Uh, and uh, the collection of my colleagues has been wonderful. And you've even heard the folks in Washington as well. So, you know, Chairman Powell has talked about how, you know, he thinks about the distributional impacts of, a, of an economy that grows for a long period of time and how that matters uh, and, and helps others get involved. Uh, and then the other thing I would say is at the local level as well, I've been really gratified by how many people have just said, you know, my hands up, I'm in uh, to, to go on this. Uh, and uh, that's true in the business community, it's true in the faith community as well. And, and I, I guess the, the challenge for all of us is, is what next? Like, how are we gonna uh, get up and, and pick up our, our, um, our collective energies and focus them on things to make real change. And I think that's, a, that's an important uh, consideration. Well, I do wanna come back to the what next as we wind things up. But before that, I did want to end, underscore one of the things you did say. And I didn't hear, any, I didn't pick up any anger. All I felt was hope. Uh, and, and in fact, there was a wonderful segment during the webinar of, I think Kyle Rizdahl was asking everybody, are you hopeful? At, at the, do you think we're in a new place? It was, a, you know, I found it to be a spiritual moment in, well, I see everything is spiritual and everything is religious, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it was a blatantly spiritual moment for Kai Rizdahl to get us into the question about hope. You want to comment on that before I give you my last question, sir? Well, first of all, Kai was great because he did ask that question of every person and it was I think it was grounding because it was really, it took these, these ideas and it made it personal. And you got to see people deep into people and got the sense of their passion. And I think of all the people who were asked, I think only one person said that it wasn't particularly hopeful, yeah. but it wasn't because he didn't want to see changes because he was frustrated yes. and he had been hopeful before and didn't want to get basically, and this is my interpretation, didn't want to get his, his feelings dashed again. Exactly. Um, but it, if he really wasn't hopeful, he wouldn't have come and spoken at the conference and felt like he could help. And, and that was an important thing. But, you know, there is, um, this is an us moment. I actually think this is uh, an opportunity for us to have a shared understanding about how the world is actually working. Uh, and with that, then can move forward to, uh, to make some change. And that's, it's, amazing. It's, a, it's the first time in my lifetime I, I can remember actually noticing or feeling something like this. It's truly remarkable. Yeah, I felt it. I felt that too. So um, it, here's a, a, another big question, but it is a, a moment from that webinar because at the end, when you were wrapping things up, you and your colleagues were wrapping these up, you were, it was really clear that you understood that this is a big ask for us all to make of this country with this particular kind of history. And that 
it um, is a, we've bitten off an awful lot, you have, and all of us who really, really care and who understand about the impact of racism on our economics, as well as just the bodies of one another. And, and you, you said you were reaching out to the community. And I was so impressed that you knew that you can't do this alone and that you must do it in community. So can you talk both about the impulse that you're having and also how that actual invitation has been responded to by the folks who are on the webinar? So, um, yeah, that, that's a very interesting thing. I guess to, to talk about this, I wanna give you a little context, which is, you know, I used to teach a class in affordable housing development when I was a professor at USC. And one of the things I used to tell the students who were in that class, because most of them, you know, you're in a teaching in a real estate program, you think people who want to build like large multifamily properties that are get sold for millions and millions of dollars. And the people who want to do affordable housing, you know, they have a, a, a service mission passion to them. And one of the things I try to tell, tell them is that if you go into a community like you're on a white horse, uh, you will probably be run out of town because too many communities have seen people come in ostensibly on a white horse uh, and then the community winds up with a mess and often worse off than they were before. And so there's a natural skepticism and there's a natural uh, resistance to unsolicited help that doesn't uh, engage with communities to know really what they think they need help with. And so we are trying very hard to not be presumptuous and not think that we understand all of the, the ins and outs and what's really needed and really just ask. Uh, you know, we, we had actually had an impulse to start the econ racism in the economy series in July, but we decided to stop and say, no, let's actually take some time to call some people see sort of where things are, what's been done, what's known, uh, and then come back with something that's going to be placed in a much better context. And I think that was brilliant. I, to wait three months and to get much more informed, I think it positioned us in a way to make sure that we're gonna talk about things that were real and that could uh, generate uh, broader support uh, in terms of action moving forward, and that's been great. Um, here in Atlanta, one, one of the things that I've been doing a lot of is uh, talking to local electeds. So a couple of days ago, I talked to electeds from South Fulton. I've talked to people in Clayton County. And it's been interesting. In many of those instances, I think they have expected me to just flip into a speech about things. And I never do that. I say, look, I want to talk about what you're wrestling with. Tell me what your needs are because we're here to serve. And it leads to a really different conversation. And, and, and I think it, it helps us actually get more on point about the things that are really needed in these communities. Sometimes, um, you know, they're so in the moment and they've got so many things coming at them that they don't really have an opportunity to step back. But by listening, we can help with that process and try to, to, uh, to uh, distill it down to a few things where we can actually make a difference. Uh, and, and those have been really really interesting and, and quite useful for us to understand uh, what's true in that community. But oftentimes, if it's true in one community, it's true in a lot of them. So if you can solve that, you can unpack a lot of things. And, and that's been uh, extremely, extremely gratifying. Well, Raphael Bostic, I want you to watch me raise my hand. I'm raising my hand on behalf of St. Luke's Church to say we want to be a partner with you. I love what you're calling us to. You're calling us to a, a more beautiful world. And, uh, and that won't happen overnight. And it certainly won't happen by any of us acting as Lone Rangers. We must be a community. So we pledge our cooperation. We wanna be in partnership with you um, and let's do it. I, I'll give an amen to that one. All Absolutely. Right. <laughs> that, that, that'll be wonderful. I hoped we could go to church here. So thank you so much, Absolutely. Raphael. Really, I always love talking with you and I'll be in touch. The pleasure is mine always, Ed. You are truly an inspiration and I'm truly blessed to have gotten to know you. Thank you, my friend. Have a great day.
Thanks, you too. And thank you all for watching our forum today. Please go to our website. There are links that I would love for you to click and learn more about the leadership of Raphael Bostic and the Atlanta Fed. You will be enriched by doing so. Thank you, have a great day.